Well, it's three o'clock um, and uh, we've got folks uh, rolling in. So why don't we go ahead and get started? It's our third meeting and we're talking about chapter two of Failure to Disrupt, which is about algorithm-driven learning. Uh, we have all kinds of folks logging in and I wanna thank everybody who has introduced themselves in the chat thus far. Um, and if you haven't, please go ahead and do so. Uh, it would be great to hear who you are and where you're at and how the weather is or how the morning or the evening is there right now. Um, and then what kinds of things that you work on and, and anything else that you wanna tell us. Um, and we've had some great conversation happening in the chat in the back channel thus far. So I'd encourage you to continue to ask questions, uh, type your observations, anything else as we go along. Um, and we're really lucky to have Christina and Neil Heffernan with us today. They're former math teachers and they run a program called uh, Assistments, uh, which we'll get a chance to learn all about and I'll um, let them introduce themselves. But why don't, why don't we start um, as we have been each week with asking you to talk a little bit about your ed tech story. So um, who are you and what is it that kind of, uh, you know, that, that when you when you think about your history with ed tech really kind of got you launched and going and maybe Christina, we can go ahead and start with you. Sure. Um, so I think technically our ed tech story together is really a love story. Um, so we started, we met teaching middle school math, but soon after we started dating, Neil went off to Carnegie Mellon and then um, after his first year, he decided to create a tutoring system online, um, which in itself was a big deal. I remember the day we were in the car and he's like, I, I can put this on the internet. And I was like, oh, okay. And um, so this sort of idea that he could build a tutor and put it on the internet was super cool in the, um, in like, like 96, 97. And then, um, but then he, he decided to make the tutor behave like a human tutor. And so he videotaped me um, tutoring my students on these specific set of problems that he had decided to focus on. And so that's how that's how we got started in the online tutoring system. Um, we Filming said that, you teaching, that's just unbelievably romantic, Christina. Isn't it? How, how, how could you resist a guy who <laughs> videotaping your teaching and using it to program a tutor? I know. <laughs> <laughs> and then we call assistments our third child. So that's really, we've been working on that since 2002, which is between the birth of our two real children who of course count more. Um, but, um, but that's sort of our, our ed tech story. But do your two regular children have millions of enrollees? I mean, really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and, and you've got one who's a sophomore in college and one who's a junior in high school? Yes, yeah. the sophomore in college is a pseudo sophomore. Um, I've decided he's going to take two sophomore years this year. He's going to have one in real life. He's working then he's got a job, a night job, and then he'll go back to school, I think, next year once things get hopefully now back to normal. So you're, you're not only an ed tech designer, but you're also a client. You're, uh, you're on the receiving yeah. <laughs> end of all of these things as well. And, and Neil, how about you? What was, what was your sort of first encounters or what, what, were, what, were, what are some other distinctive encounters with education technology you have? Like, why did you want to make a tutor to begin with? Yeah, I, I guess like, so at Carnegie Mellon, there was a group that actually was building what they call, uh, what they called intelligent tutoring systems. Um, I don't ever tell teachers that we build intelligent tutoring systems because I think there's a lot of hubris in that and raises expectations. Um, when I talk to real teachers, I say, I build slightly less dumb educational software, which I think actually is more realistic, actually. Um, anyways, I, um, I, um, but, but I really kind of grew up in that zeitgeist at Carnegie Mellon building these intelligent tutoring systems. Uh, and, and, and I knew there was something fundamentally wrong. Uh, and, um, and so uh, going into classrooms in December and some kids are on chapter two and some kids are on chapter 23 and the teacher just taught chapter 11. And I'm like, the, the technology has no relationship with what the teacher is doing. And I was like, that's not what I wanna do. Uh, and so I did, so my dissertation wound up taking me in a different direction. That's great. I, I will add to that, that, um, that the, the, there was Miss Lindquist, which is the name of the tutor that, that Neil developed in, in, at the university as part of his PhD program. But then when we got to WPI, um, uh, Neil decided to do this thing that was very much inspired by the lack of technology 
in our teaching when we were in Baltimore. So Neil was a teacher for America and I had been in, I was a return Peace Corps volunteer also teaching in Baltimore. But Neil tells the story of having, giving his kids a, a quiz every morning. And then he had a big spreadsheet on the wall with the students' names and then all the standardized, all the skills that they had to learn to pass the Maryland functional math test. And so he has got, he's got that on a big chart and then these little check marks and handing out quizzes. And he was a computer science major in college and thought to himself, this can be, a computer can do these things. And so that, that having someone who has the computer understanding of what computers can do, but also having been teaching, I think is where that, that, that marriage, for lack of a better word, of those two things from Neil, I think brought us to where we are today, which is super cool. That's great. Um, yeah, I love that image of the spreadsheet on the wall as a certain kind of pen and paper technology, and then imagining how that pen and paper technology could be implemented with education. So let, I would love to get your read on the chapter, and I should tell folks that uh, Neil was actually a very early reader of the book. He very kindly agreed to participate in a workshop that we did, um, you know, maybe six months before I turned in the final manuscript or something like that, and had some super helpful comments. Um, so, you know, in the book, I try to tell a story about where I think, you know, intelligent tutors, adaptive, uh, you know, adaptive guided learning experience comes from. Um, what would be your version of that story kind of you know where, where does the field come from what is it accomplished how, how would you all summarize the state of things um, and uh, you know where 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 are there points of disagreement with the uh, failure to disrupt or consonants maybe, Neil maybe you can get us started yeah like like um uh because like I do think that actually the people that actually build these intelligent tutoring systems like um it starts it starts from a good place which is thinking, hey, if a child has learned something, we should let them move on. Um, and uh, um, and we actually don't believe that. Meaning, actually, um, we believe that actually um, having a having actually some amount of adaptivity on tonight's homework might be useful. But we actually want to keep kids in the same place because we want to actually have whatever they're doing on the computer be relatable to what the teacher is doing. If, if the computer is all by itself and everyone's on a different page of the book, then there's not a joint experience. Uh, and, uh, um, and so it's, it, uh, um, I find it interesting, like the title of your book, right? Actually, failure to, failure to disrupt. Actually, we, we, maybe we're more, maybe we're less ambitious uh, in that actually we're like, um, we kind of, I never thought we were really going to disrupt X of the world. We were just going to make it mildly more uh, useful to make sure kids got feedback and teachers can assign these tiny little adaptive things, but th that's just for one night's worth of homework. They can assign something that's a little adaptive. And so, um, I don't know, like, and, and I think we've kept with this somewhat simple idea. Uh, and maybe that's why it's been successful. I don't know. What do you think? I was just going to say that, that I think that you know, what you said in the last chapter, the chapter one about the MOOCs and stuff and how, you know, the, the, the people who really succeed are the ones who are ready to learn and ready to do it. And you go all the way back to your example with the, with the weaving and the, um, the rainbow weavers and stuff rainbow and yeah. all those balloons and, and then in all those videos. And, you know, we've watched videos on how to put our dishwasher in and install the dishwasher and stuff like that. When you really want to learn, offering people a way to learn and a way to catch up and a way to have automation, that's super amazing. And, and I think that the, 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 con the difference between chapter one and chapter two is you went kind of from university level stuff to K-12. Mm -hmm. And so K-12, there is certainly a place for a tool that allows kids to catch up. And there's a place for you know, something that's going to do skill practice or get people, you know, get someone excited. But there's also this concern and this, this issue with, we've got a batch of students who have to clock themselves through the years. And the goal is by the end of these 12 years, they have some sort of joint understanding and that we have a country or we, you know, we have our, co our common core standards. We don't do it perfectly. And, but that is the goal is to have a society that has the same education, you know, in, in civics or in math or in history, whatever. 
And the problem with doing things with an automated tutor is you end up with a lot of kids dropping out of that a little bit, you know. Um, Be because those systems, um, while they in theory allow everyone to go at their own pace, there's a lot of reasons to be concerned that if, st if students get to choose their own pace, there will be some of them who choose an aggressive, rapid pace suitable to their um, you know, rabbit-like minds, but there'll be a lot of students who also choose a pace which is too slow, um, which is insufficiently ambitious. Um, yeah. I, I mean, I think it's great the way that you both framed it, which is that you know, the vision of a lot of folks behind algorithm-guided instruction is the notion that if we can personalize learning with a computer, that every student can move at their own pace. Um, and that really is a tension with another value that we have in schools of forming communities. Yeah. Um, I think I once observed in a talk that if you don't, that if you don't like, if you're, if you're sort of in favor of that um, more personalized, individualized approach than when you talk about a classroom, you talk about it as a batch or a cohort or mm -hmm. something that seems like a sort of suspicious sounding group. And then if you like the idea of students working together and being with each other and staying alive, then you refer, refer to it as a community or as a team or, you know, or, right. or, some, or something else that has a sort of more positive valence around it. Yeah. Um, and I, you know, I, I used to be a high school history teacher, so I come at this with with much more of a community bias. I mean, for me, it was never important how far we got or how fast kids g went through a world history curriculum. The most important thing was that together we looked at primary sources that because we all had different brains and different backgrounds, we would read these sources differently. We would have different ideas. We would come to them with different values. And we'd talk about those differences. Like th there would be, there, there's no reason to have you race past the Declaration of Independence into the War of 1812, because I want us all together talking about the War of 18, of, of the Declaration of Independence. And it sounds like you have the same feelings about math. Well, I think with math, it, yes. And, um, you know, in, in math, the skills that, that come along the way are maybe more adapted to, to technology. And you sort of mentioned that in your book. And, but I think in history, there's just as many skills. Like do you remember you know, all that memorizing of the dates and understanding the timeline and knowing where things land? When did people die and when did people live? And, and that, oh, you two lived at the same time, even though I studied you here. You know, like those things are really important. But I think in math, there's also this like, like really deep problem solving and we talk in math education about having problems that everybody can enter. And so giving a really rich problem that I, I've got a group of seventh graders, no matter, I, I know all my seventh graders can enter this problem. And then I, with all my you know, strategies, get this group to take it to a level where they're, they're actually writing expressions using variables. This group's still counting. And, and that's the rich group. But this group gets to listen to this group talk and this other group gets to listen to that group talk about the same experience and they, they really hone their mathematical thinking. So we know that that stuff's really important and that can't happen if you're learning math just from one of these automated systems. Um, and so it's, it's melding those um, at, and getting, getting the time, that's what, and when you come to the, the section of your book where you're really comparing the, the RCT done by Carnegie Learning and the RCT done by assessments, which let me pause there just so we refer we'll get to that. But they, those those two groups have some very interesting connections. Yeah, we should absolutely compare them. And we're very fortunate that someone who's joined us uh, as an attendee and is in the chat is John Payne, um, who's a researcher <laughs> at Land, who's done some of the best on on this and and has made some really terrific contributions. And so there are a number of citations in the book to John's work, um, and and hopefully he'll he'll keep chiming in as we uh, as we talk about this. Um, you know, so one question that Marion Cunningham asked, which I think is great, there seems to be a persistent desire for ed tech to infuse information into students, despite the feedback about its inconsistent success. Like, why do you think educators persist in wanting tech to have a more dominant role in education, especially since teachers often complain about the lack of support to implement the systems successfully? What, what do you all see as sort of the the, the push or the, you know, one of, one of the things about the chapter is it says implementing a new technology is in part around rhetoric. 
It's part around the stories that teachers tell, departments heads tell, trustees tell, school boards tell. I mean, these things cost money and someone needs to justify that. Like wh what are the stories out there that you find problematic or what are the stories out there that you find powerful? How is this, you know, you've been doing this for 20 years. How do you see some of those stories changing? But, you know, when you think about the kind of like the narrative and the rhetoric behind algorithm guided ed tech, you know, what strikes you about that? Well, like I, uh, um, when I hear the claim that actually, oh, hey, um, why are we doing all this tech? And actually, if, if all the pedagogy needs to change, um, like, so let's be clear, the study we did in Maine was really simple, right? Because I just built a really dumb platform. We put all of the answers for every different math textbook used in the state of Maine online. So all of a sudden, kids, instead of waiting until tomorrow, to find out which problems they got right or wrong, they knew as they went. In fact, they could then try again. And if they still needed trouble, they could actually ask uh, to be told the answer. And so like in one sense, we added immediate feedback to the math experience. We also enable teachers to actually- And, and, that's, really, and that's really the core of assessments. Like uh, you, you get assigned whatever it is, problems you were gonna do before, you just, instead of like doing one to 31 odd on a piece of paper in a workbook, you put one to 31 odd into assessments. It immediately tells you whether you got them right or wrong. It tells the teacher, you know, um, everyone got three right, but only four kids got seven right. Um, right. And then and it has a, few, a common wrong answer. It, it, it highlights the most common wrong answers. And then it has a few kind of like adaptive tutors, other kinds of practice problems that you can use as a supplement to these. Right. Things. And so, and, and so, and so, that was like, you know, according to SRI, they thought the reason why it was successful, actually, because SRI is the one that did the study, uh, they, they were like, this, this fit in with what teachers were used to doing. They're used to actually assigning homework, actually, and classwork. And then, and now they actually got to, instead of, in, you know, they could see before the kids walked in the door, which problems were hard. Uh, and so they, they could do something a little differently. In fact, what they did find is actually teachers didn't go over every item the way they used to. And of course they didn't because all the kids got feedback, but they still went over the stuff that was hard and particularly in the places where there was common wrong answers. Uh, Cause all those kids should be told, Hey, you weren't all alone. Uh, meaning actually you and half of the rest of you all screwed up this problem in the same way. Uh, and I think there's a social emotional component of actually of do doing that as opposed to just like sitting in class and realizing I, you know, I got everything wrong and not knowing everyone else or large not the numbers of other kids are in the same boat. Um, or, you know, I mean, I think there's also a really valuable contrast to how most individualized adaptive tutors are developed, where when you get something wrong, you're also the only person in the world, as far as you know, who've gotten it wrong. Right. Um, so there's a, now that social component doesn't come directly through the assistance platform to the student, right? Like when I get something wrong, I don't know, hey, don't worry, 14 of your 17 colleagues got this wrong. Yeah, in fact, I've been, I've been thinking of building that feature. I mean, like, like if you're like the first, you know, if you're the, if you're the sixth kid that has actually come into class and actually you all started and you all got number one wrong, shouldn't they actually tell you, right? I mean, like, by the way, you know, uh, and so like, I, you know, we probably should build out something like that, particularly. Well, we do. Like at the end, when the kids do their report, it does tell them how they did with respect to the class. And um, I know Neil's assistant for a, a year, her son was using assistants at school. And he was one of those, like, I'm always, he was good in math, right? He's a good math student. And then he's in sixth grade and he starts getting problems wrong. And he gets super upset. Yeah. And he finds out that he can compare himself at least to the class and see that, well, maybe I got some problems wrong. I'm still higher than everybody else. So <laughs> by getting that information for him and every, Stern student has their own, whatever their own hangups are, that was his. And it was super helpful. We do have a few teachers that really find that. I've only had complaints about that report from teachers who have never used the system. I have never heard from a teacher come back and say, I've had students crying over this report, but maybe they do. I mean, I don't know, but um, so we do tell them that, but I think that's super interesting. I will say that because you, you mentioned, it's like, we've been doing this for 20 years. I don't know if I see so much of a, a change over the last 20 years with respect to the automated tools, but, um, but I've seen a huge difference in, in teachers' 
um, confidence in using technology, mm. personal. Like, you know, even just 10 years ago, it was so hard, but then about five years ago, maybe everybody started to have a cell phone. And so the, you, you went from only a few people who weren't scared to just click around because you really can't break a technology. You just can't break it. But most teachers, like a lot of people think they can. Yep. So they're really scared. And, and that's gone away. So teachers are way more willing to just jump in, um, which of course is what we've seen in the last six months. But, and, and I, I think that the disruptor is gonna be this pandemic with technology because mm -hmm. the, the, the teachers are gonna come out of the other side of this so much more confident with technology, so much more interested in using it flexibly and, and I, with creativity. I, right. and let me just argue with that. Like, because even as a thing, their fl flexibility with technology is the wrong term because technology means so many things to yes. different people. Some people are thinking technology means graphing calculator or Desmos. When we're thinking about that, we're just thinking about our dumb way of actually doing things that is stupidly simple to adopt, right? There's other technologies that are massively difficult to adopt, right? They massively change all of your pedagogy and everything. But I think there's some simple things based on good cognitive science about immediate feedback that we can adopt relatively cheaply uh, and it doesn't require a lot of training, um, which is why when Christina was just uh, alluding to the fact that uh, during this pandemic, we went from 50,000 users to actually half a million users actually, actually used assessments in the last 30 days. And so Lots of those teachers are coming and grabbing our open educational content. And I noticed someone in the chat talked about OpenStax, which is a lovely actually OER set of textbooks at the college level. Uh, but we've, well, like, uh, uh, we've moved and most of our users are using these free actually curriculums uh, like um, Engage New York, otherwise known as Eureka Math or Lustre Mathematics, otherwise known as Open Up Resources. Uh, and, um, uh, and then we're having fun because then we're adding extra value on top of that. Uh, and um, so. So Lourdes, who's, who's a colleague of mine at MIT asked a great question, which is like, she says, give us an example of a K-12 school that's really effectively using these systems. Like, can, tell us about the, the school system that you just feel like is knocking it out of the park with assessments. Like what, can you tell us like- well, What's interesting ground? about that question is that we're, we are mostly driven now. We're, we've just started a year and a half ago, we started a foundation and we're starting to really kick up our, our sales or our outreach to districts. But really the, the question is what's a teacher that's been kicking it out of the, you know, like, and, and because for us, it's really, we have superstars, but we have yet to really become a district thing because we're freely adopted. So it's kind of like, you don't find districts that have adopted Kahoot, but you have lots of teachers who use Kahoot a lot. Um, and I think it's the same with assistance. I, like I was gonna say, like actually Chris Lesage. Chris Lesage was one of these gentlemen in the state of Maine who actually um, started to use assistance. Uh, and he actually wrote feedback questions, feed, like hint messages for every question in his proprietary textbook. Uh, I was too dumb at the time to think that actually anyone would do this. Uh, so the other teachers using those same books actually couldn't actually decide to follow Mr. Lesage or maybe try to make their own version. Um, but I recently actually, we just released and won best student paper at Learning at Scale for actually um, a project where we crowdsourced actually hint messages from teachers uh, for all of the questions in these two big actually uh, free OER textbooks. And we're gonna, we're gonna be releasing them this month and they're already inside our 1.0 product. Uh, and, uh, um, and so anyways, he was, I think it was super actually, you know, he was a psyched up teacher. Most teachers don't actually go and actually solve every problem they're assigning and actually and write explanations for every problem. But actually I'm kind of excited because I see like Wikipedia, very few people write Wikipedia entries, but lots of people can use it. And so if we can benefit from a small number of teachers that are excited to share stuff in a sort of creative commons, open sort of free way, then we can learn a lot as a field. Well, I think this conversation brings up, you know, some really interesting market dynamics in education and education technology, which don't always show up in other kinds of sectors, which is that there are really multiple entry points. You know, mm -hmm. there are 13,000 school districts in the country. 
very, very few of them are so completely centralized that a district office just decides what technology gets used in the schools and what doesn't, but there are a handful that are that yep. way. Um, there are lots of schools and districts that make technology more readily available in some places than others. Sometimes that's through buying it, but it can also be through, you know, no one has to buy assistance because it's free, um, but you would get different school-wide and district-wide adoption if they brought you in as partners for professional development or did their own internal professional development, or if there's a math department chair who's really enthusiastic about something, you know, that lets you have more teachers be involved and it lets you collaborate and grow as a team in a different way, but there's still, you know, which, which, you know, which is unusual in some places in the world, you know, an individual teacher can just be looking around at their district plan and say, I don't, I don't think what we're doing is right. I'm going to adopt this assessment things. So, but remember, they're not, they're still doing what their district said to do. They're still yeah. using the same textbook. There's, and the big adoption is right now um, because of the, the synergy between these curriculums that Neil was mentioning and our system is that the schools that are really picking them up fast right now, especially during the pandemic, were the, the schools that were using um, Engage New York. And so that was a school district push. And then they found assessments and said, I can do what my school's been telling me to do, but now you're saving me all the time of, oh, gee, I can't even print anything and get it to my students. So yeah. I was supposed to what, send PDFs to my kids? Mm -hmm. I had one teacher, she's, she emails and she says, we went home on Friday and then didn't come back. Yep. My students cool. didn't take their books home. Yep. And so she's sitting there mandated to assign engaged in your homework and her kids don't have their books. And she somehow found us on like the Facebook engaged New York group. And, and she's like, well, now I can, oh, Phew, you've saved a pandemic's weary teacher. And so that feels good. Um, but it, 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 they're not changing what the school district is saying when they're used most of the time when they're using assistance. Yeah, I, th I think that's fair. You know, they're, but, they, yeah. they are, but they are, but they are adopt, they, there is a way to adopt your tool independently yeah. of, you know, a, a department wide, school wide, district wide decision. Um, which is an interesting feature of ed tech. And there's some ed tech companies and organizations that have really tried to lead with a kind of individual teacher centered approach. You know, I'm going to try to get one teacher at a time to subscribe to these kinds of things or something like that. And then there are other parts of the market when she said, well, no, we're, you know, we're going to try to sell this thing as a whole curriculum package. Um, you know, and you all have some insulation from this because for, you know, most of your 20 years, rather than funding this thing through sales, you were funding it, you know, by getting the federal government to give you money to research it, um, you know, or other organizations so that you can give it away to everyone uh, on the side, you know, and, the, the, you know, I mean, I think you'd agree that there's quite a bit of um, sort of freedom and flexibility that comes from not, you know, having a long runway where you don't have to react to market forces. Um, you can just build the thing that you think, you know, will serve the, the teachers that you're working with best. Um, and you can, I mean, I think, I hope people here in the midst of this conversation, you know, I think we've already talked about like three things that Neil said, oh, I could do a study about that. Um, <laughs> which is like, you know, which is, I mean, I think very much a feature of, uh, you know, your all's approach. I mean, it's, I, I would say every conversation I've ever had with Neil over the years has had a feature of that, like, you know, um, not, not, none of the, you know, I mean, I think, I think you, you, you're, a, you're an exemplar of the tinkerer's mindset that is described throughout the book, which is this idea of like, okay, you know, are we going to replace all of K-12 math teaching? No. Can we build something that works better than what we had before? Yes. Um, can, can every single year, can every single new student I bring in build one thing that makes the system a little bit better? Yes. If we can get a hundred of those right, will we get to the point where students are learning this math, you know, a little bit more happily and a little bit faster? Yes. And that matters. I mean, that, that, seem, that seems like it's sort of at the heart of kind of the assistance philosophy. And, 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 and I do believe that actually one of our goals is to actually um, not just figure out how to actually make the student experience better, but actually how do we help us actually learn what are the teacher things that are useful? Like actually, uh, like right now, right now, because we actually now know what all the common wrong answers are, say for Engage New York, actually I'm writing a grant due on, on Wednesday. Because you've had, you've had thousands and thousands of kids yeah. answer problems that come from Engage New York. Yeah. And so you 
school better than the engaged New York curriculum developers do. Um, you know, that like 15,000 kids have answered problem 17 in chapter 5.3 and only 27% of them get it right on the first time. Yeah. And, like, and I'm talking about that. Even, yeah, right. And, and, and so we have all these elementary teachers that are starting to use us. And, and, uh, and the thing that her advisor, Peg Smith at the University of Pittsburgh actually really got known for is the five practices for orchestrating conversations. And the first step they actually tell, you know, pre-service teachers to get good at is anticipate what kids are going to do wrong. Your average elementary teacher didn't go into teaching elementary sometimes because of math. And so anticipating the different ways kids are going to solve problems is actually not necessarily easy for every elementary teacher. Uh, and uh, so but we could use our system to actually share with them actually the different ways they go wrong. And then maybe we can make them to be better teachers because of it. Uh, um, so. so the feedback loop includes not only students improving their math skills, but as teachers use the system and see more and more students, you know, inputting their answers, what are the patterns of correct and incorrect, um, then we start, you know, saying that, that the teachers could be learning too. I mean, I think I mentioned this last, in a previous week that you know, I have a colleague here, Peter Senge, who talks about learning organizations, that when, that when firms of any kind are well-designed, when people are going about doing their, their daily job, they're not just getting things done, they're learning more about the work that they're doing, and assessments has that built into them. Now, yeah. Christina, part of the shop that you look at is how, how you support teachers right. in developing these skills and integrating it, and I think that, you know, that is a theme that I hope a bunch of people come away from the book with, that really good education technology is not just about downloading software on people's computers or pointing them to the right website, but building the capacity of teachers and students um, to, to be able to thoughtfully use these tools. Like what, you know, in your ideal sort of induction program for teachers, you know, what do they need to learn? What are you doing well now? What do you hope to do more of in the future in terms of supporting teachers? Well, I think that's a good question. Um, so a lot of our um, iteration of teacher training has been through these um, randomized control trials that we've been funded to do. Otherwise, we didn't have any, like I taught a class at WPI and through another grant on formative assessment. So formative assessment itself is a, you know, it's a processed, a process that teachers and students partake in and, and um, technology is, like assessments is super helpful in that process. So teaching a class on formative assessment and then use assessments while you're doing that, those teachers became, and, and during that time was really a develop, we were developing the tool. So we, we basically, it was a win-win between me and Neil and those teachers. They were telling us what they wanted. We were iterating the development, making the, you know, so that, that was kind of weird. Now that we're a little bit more solid in what the product is, um, in our first grant up in the state of Maine, uh, I was like, Neil, we have to do coaching. Like I was, a, I was, I had been coaching in Boston, Boston Public Schools. I really loved the idea of teacher coaching. And so what happens with coaching is you, especially back in 2011, you've got teachers with lots of different technology backgrounds. So you have to coach them at wherever they are. And for many mm -hmm. of those teachers, it's just computer, you know, like they gasp, they hold their breath, they don't know what to do. And so getting them past that, the other teachers are like, yeah, yeah, no, I use this and this and this on the computers. What am I supposed to do with your thing? Okay. And then with them, you can coach them because it's a one-on-one -on -one coaching to start to think about what to do with the data and what are you going to do with the mathematics and all this. So a coaching was really good when people are at different stages, especially with technology. Um, but that's pretty expensive, the, the coaching, one-on-one -on -one coaching. Um, and so... We did that again in our replication because we were supposed to replicate the study, so it had to be the same. But we are also doing a, a, a effectiveness study, and the effectiveness study can be a little bit less hands-on. And so with that one, we have mentoring, which is like the coaching, but it's done on, on online with like a Zoom call. So it's kind of like call in help, and, but that's still one-on-one. -on -one. With our most recent funding, which is to the EIR grant that we got to scale up assessments but that also has an RCT in it, we're right now creating virtual PLCs. And the PLC part, the professional learning community, is super important because assessments is not a thing that just happens. You don't just sit kids down and say, oh, I got them in their seat, they're gonna sit still, it's all set. It's something that teachers have to use and engage with. 
and um, it can feed into growth mindset stuff. It can feed into space practice stuff. It can feed into formative assessment stuff. It can feed into, you know, all these different already learned things. What's important about that for adoption is that all of these schools have been spending years getting their ducks in a row with one of those things. I don't know which one. And we don't come in and say, nope, swish that away, which teachers hate. We yep. say, what have you been doing? Okay, now use assistance to help you with that. And, Great. And so, so schools, I mean, I, there are two things that I hear there. One is this notion that one of the things that you're sort of experimenting with is what is the level of support that a system needs to provide teachers for them to be able to implement this well and help yeah. their students learn? Which is in a sense, the parallel question that assessment asks, you know, yeah. what is the hey, level I of, have, sort of technology noticed. support hey. that a student nice. needs to have um, in order to learn math? And, you know, and we wanna have these kinds of trade-offs of saying, you know, if, if we can make it a little bit cheaper, um, then that's a good thing because, you know, there's an opportunity cost of everything that we're doing. So if a virtual PLC where we just have to pay for a little bit of teacher time to connect with each other works as well as hiring an individual person to drive to their classroom and sit in the back and coach them, um, you know, then there may still be some, there may still be some coaching that we want to have happen. You know, maybe there's a district which is like really struggling with mathematics in yeah. which one-on-one -on -one coaching is absolutely still the right thing to do. But there may be other places where, ah, you know, we could actually like, this group can sort of figure figure things out together yeah you were gonna say and, and it's it's super important that we're not coming in and saying sweep all of this away don't we're not saying take away your curriculum or take oh you spent three years on differentiated instruction oh no no we're moving away from that we're going to do this again it's it's like oh you're doing differentiated differentiated instruction well i bet when you're doing differentiated instruction you want to have um um flexible grouping Okay, how are you gonna determine your flexible groups? Well, one thing you can do is use assistance data, you know, and so what, you have to listen first and that's where the PLCs, you're listening to where people are and then you let them percolate up with what they wanna use assistance for. That's great. And so, so the fact, I mean, although one enormous complexity of that is that, you know, 13,000 school districts, 130,000 schools, there are a lot of different things that people could have been working on in math. Yeah. Um, and so your coaches, your team need to have a familiarity with that range. Now, one thing that's sort of helpful is that there's probably seven big ones, yeah. you know, that you can sort of really tie into. And you mentioned them, formative assessment, differentiated instruction, um, you know, the response to intervention, uh, uh, you know, really trying to growth mindset, having, having teachers actually really know, you know, especially in elementary school, sort of content knowledge about math and so forth. Um, but, uh, you know, there's also a long tail of a lot of different, you know, ways that, that schools describe those things. And, um, you know, and so what, what you're trying, you know, and, and, and it means that you can't, as you said, just sort of plug in, you know, right. uh, like just slot assessment automatically in and press play you have to have this belief that there's an interface between the human community and the technology supports um, and that it's really only by engaging the human community, you know, not, not only in some new stuff, but in some stuff they were already at. Like, what are you already good at? What do you already care about struggling with? What are you already committed to? And let's build from and, and work on that. I mean, you know, yeah. to me, that's very, uh, very well aligned with how I think schools yeah. get better. Um, in part because teachers are so exhausted by being told every two or three years that there's a brand yeah. new thing coming along. I mean, you know, so so in, in a common approach, when a new thing comes along, it's like, ah, this technology is one more thing. And you all get to engage them in a conversation. They, no, no, this is not one more thing. We're still doing differentiated instruction. We're still doing growth mindset. We're still doing your thing. We're just doing your thing with a tool that's going to help you do your thing better. Right. Yeah. And, and, and also, teachers are super smart. And they're super engaged in their craft. And so you really want to, you don't, you don't, you need to engage that in schools because in schools is where the, the children go to be exposed to that craft and to be exposed to the, to the synergy and the excitement. I mean, I think kids across the country these days have been realizing, gee, I want to go to school. Yeah. Right. You know? And um, so it's, yeah, they like, it's, so, but it, it, they want to go to school because the teachers are there. What what can you get, you know, let, let's go, let's go to where we are now and go to the school. So for the first time you've been distributing assessments, not just 
as kind of a homework helper. Right. Um, but you know, increasingly it's gotta be slotted into these fully hybrid, fully online kinds of modalities. You know, what are you learning? How are teachers? So you've, and you have the surge of users, you have 10 or 20 yeah. times as many users as you have before. What, what are you learning from that experience? How is, uh, how is assessments being stretched? Yeah. Um, so we were, we were very conveniently in October, we got a big, large grant to scale up. And when we applied for that grant, we started the Assistance Foundation. So we're a spinoff of WPI. So we, what we say is we say that Assistance is a joint project of the, the WPI and the Assistance Foundation. And so the Assistance Foundation is um, providing that structure. And so we were already working on scaling up our this infrastructure and we were already getting our support kind of figured out and we had new staff members starting to really develop this virtual PLC that we were gonna offer next fall to this in this study. And so we had these things going in place. We did find that um, during the spring when we started to do some marketing work, we're like, let's stop calling it a homework tool and call it, you know, so it's not about homework, it's about assigning online and making yep. <laughs> it more generic. We were already going there because we found that a lot of our teachers used assistance in class for do nows or warm ups or exit tickets or, so we're agnostic. Um, and so why just call it homework? But homework is such a good storytelling because it, everyone knows what homework is. So when they, and they also know that the deficiencies of homework, kids are sitting at home alone and teachers are then infused with students into their classroom and they have no idea what happened last night until they start to hear the little bits and pieces. Um, and so homework tells our story really well, but we have become something we now say we as, it's a, assistance is a tool for assigning online, and we don't we're agnostic. Which, which which people are doing at home, which people are doing yeah. synchronously. On Everything Zoom. homework now, right? You know, so like, what do you do with that? Um, um, Neil, what kind of what kind of research are you going to be doing, Neil? What 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 new learning opportunities show up because of all of this? So one thing that excites me right now is actually uh, we have a project. Um, so 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 uh, even before the pandemic hit, we had. 3 million open-ended questions that were asked, actually. Um, uh, that means 3 million times some kid wrote some explanation. And by the way, if you go look at these modern curriculums, almost half of the math questions are please explain. And it's super important. Teachers care a lot. The Common Core cares a lot about your ability to communicate and not just compute numbers. And so we think it's really important uh, for that. But we had thousands, well, no, we had millions of instances where children were not getting anything from their teachers that we could tell. Now, by the way, the teacher the teacher can pull up the kind of the report and see and, and talk to their kids about um, the different ways they solve problems and explained it. Uh, and so it doesn't mean like every homework question needs to be graded. In fact, we, we, we hate that idea uh, and homework should be formative. Um, but so, so anyways, we looked at actually, we looked at the different uh, uh, we did a quick look at actually this, and then we're like, let's actually figure out how um, to get a bunch of teachers to actually um, see if we could make suggestions to other teachers of what you might want to say to these kids. Uh, and so we wound up building this product actually after we had about 10 teachers um, grade, uh, well, like look at their kids open ended responses each night, and then write back feedback so that we could then make suggestions to other teachers saying, for this kid who maybe said almost nothing, you might wanna say, could you say a little more? Uh, and a child that says a beautiful answer, you might wanna say good. Uh, and then somewhere in between, you might wanna actually help them try to move them along the path. And so anyways, this this obviously involves a certain type of natural language processing. You uh, typically is thought of as an AI sort of topic. And since I teach AI, that's what I do. But I'm also smart enough to realize we will always get this wrong, right? So we need to do what Google Smart Reply does, which is we just tell the teacher, you might wanna say one of these three things. Uh, and uh, we already know that our teachers like this for triage. For the instances when actually, there, there was 18,000 comments that were actually answered with this thing called Crick Comments. Uh, and they basically use our suggestions for when actually the kid has got a really low score or a really high score. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, uh, and so that gives us plenty of room to improve, uh, but at the same time, they, they're they like, this this is a useful tool. And in fact, I was getting this advice, which is like, 
one of our teacher trainers uses this and she's like, this gets more teachers to actually want to even make a comment back to a kid because they see, oh, they see comments and it even, maybe even encourages them to ask the open-ended questions, uh, which they're sometimes inclined not to ask because they kind of know, well, if, they're, if kids are going to answer it, we should give them feedback. And so anyways, I'm hoping we'll, we'll, we'll see good stuff coming out of that. Um, when I was teaching between 2003 and 2006, I used to take the spell check in Microsoft Word and you can add whatever you want to spell check. Oh, no, maybe it's like auto to autocomplete. Um, yeah. So I used to program, you know, like TS1 would be something like this paragraph doesn't have a thesis statement. Please do this, that, or the other thing. So I could sort of, you know, use comments to kind of automatically include those things. It sounds like, yeah, yeah you know, it's, 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 it's kind of similar. The other yeah. thing that, that um, so Neil was working on a, on a report with his students, his, his graduate students, um, that where you could move. So we assessment is homework, but then what about in class? And what can we do to help teachers while their students are doing independent practice in class? And what kind of reports are better? And so this report had desks that you could move around. And so then you could glance at the report and see like a flashing red, just to be simplistic here. And then you're like, oh, that kid, and they're over there. And then you walk over to them. But then we moved to the pandemic. And I think within three weeks, you and, and Ashish had rewritten this exact thing to be like a, a horse race. And so you could see the kids moving through the five problems and then you could see where kids were. And the idea would be that you'd watch this report while they're in Zoom calls doing their work. And then you could ping out the kids or chat to them or reach out to the ones who you see with something good or bad happening or struggling or, you know, and you could just watch this other report. So it's switching yeah, our reports really to match the environment. Telling us during the pandemic is that one of the things you want to, you know, the way you might have done that um, in a classroom is to wander around yeah. and you sort of look over kids' shoulders and you're like, this one's on 17, this one's on three, um, this one's, in, you know, like this one keeps putting in answers that don't make any sense. <laughs> I'm yeah. just glancing at it. I can see this one's not. And then you decide how you want to direct your attention um, in that way. Um, and, you know, and, and essentially what you've done is created a sort of computational dashboard of being able to see that. Um, you know, one set of concerns that emerges with that is the idea of, you know, like there's a certain amount of privacy sitting at your desk, you know, you're like not being automatically put into a horse race with everyone else and your students. Um, what Have you gotten feedback, you know, from your graduate students and your own discussions from the teachers that you work with? Like, is there a point where the sort of datafication and quantification becomes too much or becomes too harmful? Or what sort, what sort of safeguards or theories do you have around that in your work? I guess, I guess like this comes back to like, hey, is education meant to be competitive or not? Right, and so when Christina alluded to the fact that a child could see, hey, I wasn't the only one that got this wrong, you could think of that negatively, which is, oh, other people can see like uh, that, well, like some kids did get it right. Uh, but I think if you have the right attitude, uh, and so when I was, a, Christina alluded to the fact that my second year actually uh, teaching, I was, I convinced my school principal that we should run a real algebra class in downtown Baltimore, because they'd never run an algebra class. And I put, actually the the kids scores on the seventh grade test I gave them at the beginning of the year on the on the board uh, and so everyone could see what everyone got right or wrong uh, this would violate actually normally people's sense of oh what's going on like is, this is my privacy but I'm like every single one of you can get every one of these adding subtracting multiplying dividing whole numbers fractions decimals percents you're here in algebra class I just got to make sure you got Every one of them filled in. Every one of them got every one of them filled in before the before the first six months or the first three, the first thirty days or thirty items on the Maryland Functional Math Test. So if you if teachers actually have an attitude or children actually have an attitude that is all just a competition, uh, but if then maybe then then you could use these sorts of tools badly. Uh, and uh, um, but if you have the right attitude, which is Everyone can learn this material, actually. Some kids are gonna need a little bit more support and some kids are gonna to need to actually get to 10, 10 items before they actually master Pythagorean theorem. Then, then maybe, anyways, so our goal is that with the right attitude, you can use this technology effectively. Yeah. But 
you clearly can also use technology badly too, right? Actually, uh, I was I was reaching out to teachers that were using actually assistants recently uh, that were using Engage New York. Uh, and I'm like, what do you like about it? They're like, oh, I love this. And I'm like, tell me about how, how you use the reports. And they're like, there are reports? And I'm like, holy cow, how did you like, and I turned to my wife and I'm like, should we ban teachers that aren't using our reports? <laughs> like we built this technology so that you could decide to use this data and to do something differently. If the only reason why you're using this is so that kids get feedback, should we prevent teachers from doing it? Because like, there's part of me that actually wants to ban that. Uh, and uh, and like, unless you log in and check, uh, then um, we have not banned teachers from uh, <laughs> using assessments if they don't look at reports, but I still kind of think I don't know, we almost should, like, it feels almost immoral for a teacher to not look at data on their kids, actually. Uh, but that's but our fault for not having it evident how they're supposed to look at it. I don't know, but anyways. <laughs> but I, th no, I mean, I think it's a great question that, that all, these things all connect to each other. The, the gathering of data, what the technology does with that data, what the teachers do in places, and there are better and worse ways of sort of assembling all of those different pieces. Um, mm -hmm. And we have we have eliminated the word grade from anywhere. So we call everything a score. And we're struggling with the percent correct that you get from um, every problem set. So when you do six or seven or eight problems, you end up getting this percent correct. And we've got this sort of very simplistic, but very understandable partial credit system. Um, and it's it's easy to it's easy to understand, but it's hard to but it doesn't quite work for a grade. And yeah. we're kind of like, you know what? None of this, like the whole concept of grades is something that's, that has to be very much thought about as, a, as teachers. And, and one of our, you asked about uh, a good adopter. So we have a, a teacher who um, he, he's, written, he's written some blogs and stuff and he writes about, he's decided to be a gradeless classroom in a school that provides grades, but the only grade that he produces in the whole year is one um, is one at the midterms and one at the end of the year. Whenever he needs to put it on a report card for the school district, that's when a number comes and the kids actually tell him the numbers. So, but he, he still uses assessments because the scores are super important. But the, he has to work really hard at the beginning of the year to get the kids to like let go of, and the parents um, of grades. And so that's, that is more our struggle. Is, is we have the internal beliefs, most of our team, but trying to get and explain that to users is something that we work on. I, that's, a, that's a great preview for what we're gonna be talking about in a few weeks, which is the chapter on the curse of the familiar, um, oh. which is how do, you, how do you develop technologies that get people to adopt new practices? Yeah. Um, and I think assistments is an example of, you know, one of the things I argue in the book is that, that one way to do that is to give people familiar stuff and have the familiar stuff take them on a journey to somewhere unfamiliar. Um, so, so start with us and we'll just be sort of checking your homework for you, but eventually we're gonna try to give you these new ideas about you know, the role of formative assessment in classrooms. Um, there was a great question up here from uh, Kevin, which I'll answer, which is the book is titled Failure to Disrupt. And then we spent an hour talking about how great assistance is. Um, is assistance actually disrupting our approach or anyway, or is it sex successful because it's not disruptive? And my, I don't know if you have a different answer, but my answer to that question is right. It's successful because it's not disruptive, because it's not stepping into systems and saying, we can completely transform the way you teach mathematics. You know, your, 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 your students will, will we're going to reorganize the structure of school schools, things will be profoundly yeah. different. And I, and I think those kinds of promises to schools are very, very rarely kept. Um, but I think the promise of we can do things better and two things will happen when you adopt this technology. First, you'll have some new tools for doing things better. So some things that used to be hard, like taking Neil's, um, you know, uh, spreadsheet on the wall of where all the students are at and their, and their progress, we're going to make that easier. But the existence of this technology is going to give us a site for having a conversation 
about mastery learning and gradeless classrooms, like a conversation we might not be having otherwise. Yeah. Um, so, so to me, you know, that, I mean, this is why I'm delighted to have Neil and Christina join us and why I enjoy following the progress of assessments um, because the evidence seems to suggest that it, like as math software goes, this seems to be about as helpful as anything anyone else has built at any kind of scale. Right. I guess, I guess like this gets to like, how do you think actually make things better in education, right? Like mm -hmm. this is like Hamilton and Jefferson. Like Hamilton, you know, Jefferson was a revolutionary, he wants a revolution every 20 years, actually. And Hamilton doesn't want that. And I think I'm Alexander Hamilton, right? Actually, which is like, like, how can we just make this mildly better, actually? Uh, and let's just make sure we prevent him from going out and fighting a duel. <laughs> <laughs> a duel with someone from Mafia or something like that. Good. Well, Neil and Christina, um, it's been wonderful having you. Thanks to all of you who uh, joined us for this session. Um, next week, we're going to be talking about peer-driven learning environments. We're going to be talking with Natalie Rusk um, and Mitch Resnick. Um, thanks for all the conversation that was happening in the back channel. Um, appreciate the questions that popped up. Um, and uh, um, I hope folks continue to, to make progress in these uh, difficult months uh, during the pandemic, but, but really great to have this conversation be part of our weeks. So thank you. Um, any thank final thoughts, Neil or Christina? Thank you for having us. Actually, it's a great book and I appreciate the service you've done by actually getting it out. Yeah, and it's great. I, I'm looking forward to reading chapter three and then watching chapter three's video, so. <laughs> Good, well, glad thanks. to have you join us. All right, thanks everybody. Have a great afternoon. All right, bye-bye.